Hey! Okay, from the great white sharks of Australia to the Greenlandic sharks in Greenland, from the penguins of Argentina and Chile, you know, right above the South Pole, to the polar bears and the reindeer of the North Pole, you know, Canada, Alaska, Greenland, um, from the llamas of the Andes to the kangaroo, from the, I'm sorry, from the koalas and kangaroos from Australia to the llamas of the Andes, the anacondas of Brazil, the coyotes of Mexico and the American Southwest, the manatees of Florida, the beavers of Oregon, Washington, and the Pacific Northwest, the grizzly bears and the Kodiak bears all the way from the Pacific Northwest to Alaska, the buffalo of the American and Canadian prairies, and the great big mooses of U.S. and Canada, and to the wolves of Europe. This is our country. You know, U.S., uh, Canada, Europe, North America, South America, and Australia. I call it the We Like Women Pride Union. You know, we like women. We are proud to like women. And if they do not like women, they are the enemy. This is our country. Yeah, so my goal is to create the biggest country. Um, uh, there's Europe, North America, South America, and Australia. There's different versions. One is the U.S., Canada, Australia, and the U.K. You know, they're the big English-speaking countries. You know, unite them into a superpower. Of course, you know, in Canada, they speak French. In the U.S., they speak a lot of Spanish. But, you know, we're all going to be one big country. Also, Europe, European, American, Australian, Canadian Union. That's kind of cool that Europeans create a European Union. So we can all become one big country. Also, Europe, North America, South America, and Australia. Australia. So we're all going to be one big country. Usually what I like, I like to do is talk about a local city or a local cool place, like a historical place or like a national monument or some, you know, natural thing in each of these countries, you know, really quickly in, in my videos to make us one country. And again, okay, why should we become a superpower? Well, number one is we're one big happy family. We've gone back over 500 years, you know what I mean? Da, uh, you know, like uh, in Europe, North America, South America, we're, we've are we we've had the in intermingling with the indigenous people of the Americas, the Hispanics, and all the white people in North America, South America, and Europe for over 500 years. And in Australia, it's been 230 years. So number one, we're like one big happy family. Uh, you know, uh, we, could all, we should all unite and become one country. And most of our languages... Uh, are European-based languages. You know, of course, we respect the indigenous people and we respect indigenous languages, but most of us in Europe, North America, South America, and Australia, we speak either English or French or Spanish or Portuguese or, you know, uh, uh, European languages, you know, um, you know, for, for the many Europeans. And so we're all like one big happy family that's gone back for a long time, you know. Uh, you know, the, our letters are ABC, you know what I mean? The, they're the ABC letters. So, uh yeah, let's unite and let's become one big happy country. Uh, that's pretty. Another one is um, uh, massive threats. You know these countries with over like uh, China. Well, we're 1.4 billion Chinese. They're becoming a superpower military. So we got to unite as one big family. If we unite, there'll be 1.8 billion of us. You know, rumors are the coronavirus. It's a biological warfare from China. I don't know if it's true or not. You know, but I hear rumors. You know, okay, so we got to unite against. The, you know, the, the, this big country developing these weapons, biological weapons. I hear rumors of nanotechnology weapons. Uh, you know, they're building up their navy and their military, so we got to unite our military. You know, especially like the natives of U.S., Canada, Mexico, Central, South America, and Australia and the Pacific and Europe and the Atlantic. You know, we could all become one big country. Um, Okay, uh, another one is India. 1.3 billion Indians. The Indians are much friendlier, but it's 1.3 billion of them, and they're building up their military. And whenever a country builds up their military, uh, every time in history, something might go wrong, you know, where they could become an enemy in a, in, in a hurry, you know, or like a Cold War foe, you know. Uh, but usually, but they're pretty friendly. Over 5 billion Asians are building up their military. Um, over 1 billion Africans are going on to 2 billion, from what I hear, and, and you know, a very high birth rate, uh, you know, they're, and they're building up their military, too. Another one is these, these really crazy Islamic countries. You know, they believe in holy war. They always got some sort of war going on for some reason. You know, and they're becoming much more high tech. So we should all unite and become a superpower. Europe, North America, South America, and Australia. And, um, okay, and so, okay, I'm going to talk about certain cities. Um, for the United States, I'm going to talk about Anchorage, Alaska today. For Canada, I'm going to talk about Fort Nelson, Canada. For Australia, I'm going to talk about the city of Tennant Creek, Australia. And for the UK, I'm going to talk about the city of Stoke-on-Trent. You know, that, that's going to be our, our cities uh, for the UK, Canada, Australia, US. Now, with the Europe bringing in a European, American, Australian, Canadian Union, I'm going to talk about Lucerne, Switzerland. Um, and for Europe, North America, South America, and Australia, I'm going to talk about the city of Porto Velho in the Brazilian Amazon forest. Yeah, the Amazon is very beautiful.
And also, I am in the state of Colorado, and I make it a point wherever I'm at, I like to talk about a city, uh, like in the local state that I'm at. So I, right now I'm in Colorado, so I'm going to talk about the city of Georgetown, Colorado. I was in the city about four or five days ago, really beautiful city in the beautiful Rockies. And, um, you know, like I did this podcast before in Oregon and I started talking about local cities in Oregon, you know, cause I was in Oregon. So I also, we'll just, uh, bring it up here. And now, now these cities have no affiliation with me, all this stuff. Most of it is through Wikipedia, which has creative comments. It's, it's all public information. You know what I mean? I'm just bringing this. Let's, I'm trying to make this an entertaining show. Let's all become one country, the European, American, Australian, Canadian union. And in the future, I plan on making better videos with more special effects and starting businesses to do this. And a lot of people think it's kind of cool. I talk, I have several hundred people on some email lists and they think it's really cool to become one country okay so we're going to talk about the city of anchorage alaska uh, okay anchorage alaska in 2018 it had a population of around 300,000. that's about 40 percent of alaska's population alaska's the biggest state in the u.s and i believe it's got the the second smallest population i think wyoming's the only one with the smaller population the Anchorage metropolitan area is bigger than the state of Rhode Island. So the Anchorage municipality, you know, is bigger than Rhode Island. You know, that's a state, you know, very, very big city. Uh, um, the nickname is the City of Lights and Flowers and Los Anchorage. Um, maybe because I got the Aurora Borealis up there. Maybe that's why it's called the City of Lights and Flowers. I'm not sure. Um, now, this is really cool. In 1778, James Cook mapped this area and called it Cook Inlet. And James Cook, you know, he explored, he really explored the United States, the Oregon and Washington coast, the, the Canadian coast. He mapped that whole area, you know, for, and also Alaska, the Cook Inlet. He went all the way up into Alaska. And he also explored Australia. You know, he was famous for that, you know, from Botany Bay, Sydney, all the way up to the east coast of Australia. There's a university in Australia named the James Cook University, the Cook Inlet here in Alaska. And so James Cook is one of the founding fathers of this UK, Canada, Australia, US becoming one country. You know, he's from the UK and that's one of our goals. Let's become one big country. So he really explored Australia, Canada, you know, and, 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 and the US. So he's one of our founding fathers, James Cook, you know, um, one of the most relevant figures in, in us in the history of US, Canada, and Australia. And um, anyways, he explored this area, Cook Inlet. It's called the Cook Inlet. And uh, now there was a huge Russian presence in South Central Alaska. Up, uh, uh, they've been there for a long time. And it was um, until 1867, the U.S. Secretary of State, William Seward, he bought Russia uh, for $7.2 million. That's about seven cents an acre. That's about $109 million in 2018 dollars. And um, yeah, and then people were making fun of it. They called it Seward's Icebox, Seward's Folly, Wall Russia, you know, like like the walrus, wall rush out. Um, in 1888, gold was discovered in the Ternangian Arm, which is right south of Anchorage. So that's brought people there, you know. Um, 1912, Alaska became an incorporated U.S. territory. Um, the Native Americans that lived here, there were Alaskan Athabascans that were called the Denina. Uh, in 1911, uh, J.D. Butt Whitney and Jim St. Clair lived at the mouth of, of, uh, of this area. And uh, in 1912, Jack Brown, a forest ranger, and his wife Nellie lived here. In 1914, there was a guy named Frederick Mears. He chose a site to build a railroad, you know, railroad to, through Alaska. So it quickly became a big a tent city. People started moving out here. Um, in 19, there was, there was an interesting thing. In 1915, um, th there, was, uh, there was a movement to change the name of Anchorage to Alaska City. Um, but it, 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 was, it almost went through, but it didn't go through. So they, stayed in, so they kept it Anchorage. Um, in November 23rd, 1920, Anchorage became an incorporated city. Now, in 1923, Alaska, the, the Alaska Railroad was completed, and, um, and uh, you know, and they had a really uh, interesting name. This guy name was Otto F. Olsen. He was a Swedish-born general manager who ran the railroad from the 1920s and 1930s. Very serious guy, no-nonsense kind of guy. But the railroad um, um, and everything, um, the city was really growing because of the railroad. You know what I mean? It brought some people in there. Now, from the 1930s to 1950s, the city started to massive, massively grow because of air transportation and the U.S. military. The U.S. military uh, uh, put some bases here and, and um, 
you know, in, in, in the 1940s, the Almendorf Air Force Base and the Fort Richardson Army Base. And that really bring they, these two bases brought a lot of people here. Um, during the 1950s, the Cold War was happening, you know, with Russia. So this Elmendorf Air Force Base was very, very important because, you know, a lot of activity, you know, they got to send those planes out there to watch the Russians, you know. Uh, um, and so uh, so a lot of people went there. Now, this, in the year 2005, this base joined together. It became Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson. That was a, a cost-cutting plan for the U.S. military. They, they closed down two or three bases and made it one base. So it was a, it's a joint Army and Air Force base now. Um, um, so it's pretty cool. In the year 1951, the Anchorage uh, International Airport became the main airport here. Uh, they built one here. Uh, that airport is the number one airport. Uh, no, it's the fourth largest airport in the world for cargo traffic. Uh, not a lot of people going there, but cargo because it's a lot. It's a lot faster to go over the Arctic. You know, it saves a lot of energy. Uh, you know, it saves a lot of miles. So a lot of cargo in Anchorage. Believe it or not, huge, huge airport for cargo traffic. Traffic, not people. Now, um, this is interesting. The world's second largest earthquake in history, in recorded history, happened here in Anchorage on March 27th, 1964. It was called the Good Friday Earthquake. A magnitude of 9.2. It killed 115 people. I saw pictures of it. Streets were just broken up everywhere. There was these houses that were 250 to 350, 250 to 300 feet above sea level. A dozens of these homes, and they all went down to sea level. So they sank like 300 feet because of this earthquake, you know. Um, now, this really helped improve the economy of Alaska. In 1968, ARCO, you know, ARCO gas station, they discovered oil in Prudhoe Bay, which is on the Alaska North Slope in the Arctic, and that brought a huge oil boom to the state of Alaska. You know, more railroad activity, more, more activity, you know, um, and that's, that's pretty cool. Now, in the year 1975, the city of Anchorage uh, and the greater Anchorage area, they all they all united. This included cities of Eagle River, Girdwood, Glen Alps, and several other cities. They all merged into the municipality of Anchorage. Um, yeah, you know, and... Uh, yeah, yeah, and so, so it was pretty cool. This area contains a majority of the population of Alaska, this area between Anchorage and Fairbanks. Uh, there were several movements to, uh, at least three of them, to try to move the capital of Alaska from Juneau to Anchorage, 1960, 1962, 1974. Um, in 1976, there was voters approved to move to, to build a capital city um, near Willow, which is very close to Anchorage, but uh, because it needed, it, they needed to... Uh, there was a vote to have an extra $1 billion. It was going to cost at least $1 billion in bonds to build a city. So the voters voted against it. because So they voted for it, but because it was too expensive, they needed an extra billion-dollar bond to build a capital city here. They voted against it. Um, yeah, so this is really cool. Alaska is just a, a really, really cool place. Um, famous people from this area, Sarah Palin from Wasilla, which is in the Anchorage municipality, like a, like a suburb of Anchorage. You know, she was a, a presidential candidate for under John McCain. Um, and yeah, and the famous, you know, James Cook, the Cook Inlet, uh, one of the very famous, you know, Cook Inlet is still named after him, you know. And he, again, he is a symbol of what we're trying to do, U.S., Canada, and Australia becoming one country. James Cook is it. You know, he is one of them, you know, from the U.S. UK, and he really explored, you know, Canada, Australia, and the U.S. So he's like one of our founding fathers of creating this big country. Now, so now in Canada, Fort Nelson, Canada, which is not too far from Alaska. It's on the Alaska Highway at mile 300, uh, north of the, in the Peace River region, north of the Rocky Mountains. In 2016, the population was 3,400. Fort Nelson in the eighteen in the year eighteen oh five, Fort Nelson uh, was established by the Northwest Trading Company. They were a fur trading company, and they named this fort in honor of Horatio Nelson. You no, know, Horatio Nelson. He was that famous, you know, the one-eyed, one-armed captain. You know, he lost his leg before, and uh, yeah, he lost his arm, and he lost his uh, his eye. He was one eye, one armed, and he was famous for defeating the French and the Spanish. You know, when he fought against the wars against. No, against Napoleon, Napoleon's fleet in the Battle of Trafalgar, you know, so he was really famous for that, you know, they have a Trafalgar Square with a huge statue of Nelson, you know, he defeated the French and the Spanish, you know, one-armed, one-eyed, uh, one-eyed captain, he's pretty interesting, you know, one-armed, one-eyed, and uh, so Fort Nelson was named after this guy, 
Um, Fort Nelson became, uh, uh, so it was basically pretty much a military base the whole time, uh, you know, a base. In World War II, it became a very valuable military asset. It became very important. And it was the original model zero uh, of the Alaska Highway when it was built. And so the, the Alaska Highway story was built here. And that was a very interesting story where during World War II, they really thought the Japanese were going to invade Alaska. You know, the, the, the Americans and Canadians were very scared of Japan invading Alaska. <laughs> So they wanted to build this Alaska Highway. So in the year 1942, they sent 11,000 people into, um, you know, they sent 11,000 people into Alaska to build this highway. And they built it within nine months. It was almost like just 24 hours working around the clock to build this highway, you know, uh, 11,000 soldiers. It's a very interesting documentary. And... Um, and what happened was, well, so, so they built this, and, and the Japanese never invaded that part of Alaska, the mainland Alaska, but they, they did invade an Aleutian Island, um, and they did invade an Alaskan Aleutian Island. Uh, and, um, the, the, yeah, in 1945, the Japanese surrendered. The U.S. gave the Canadian Alaska Highway back to Canada. Uh, in 1948, the um, Canada gave public access to the Alaska Highway. In the early 1950s, um, the, the U.S. military began to lease land to, to people, to civilians. So it became an actual civilian city. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of Fort Nelson. They had their, um, their oil and gas boom and they had a timber boom, you know, which was one of their, their main industries. But what happened was oil prices massively dropped and sort of the timber dropped. So they lost a lot of people. Um, they had, you know, a natural gas power plant and, and it was actually booming for a while, but because of the, uh, of the prices in oil and, and gas and the, and the timber, you know, there were some people that are against, you know, uh, environmentalists that were against the timber. So, so the economy really declined. But, you know, it's still, um, it's still a big, big tourism place, a lot of tourism, and there's a lot of government sector jobs, you know, and so that's one of the main economies. So that's Fort Nelson. And again, I want us to get familiar with all these cities because, you know, if we're going to become one country, we might as well know about these cities. Uh, and in the future, I do plan on making more entertaining videos. Now, Australia, we're going to talk about Tennant Creek, Australia. Uh, and Australia, now this is the, the seventh largest town in the, in the Northern Territory. It's along the Stort Highway, which is known as the Explorers Highway, and along the uh, the Barkley High, Barkley Highway, which is known as the Overlanders Way, um, and uh, yeah, there's, uh, uh, it's right there in the middle of cattle grazing land. This whole area is about the same size as the UK and the same size as New Zealand. There's open grass grasslands, and it's like one of the world's some of the world's largest cattle stations are here. Um, the original Aborigines that lived here were called the Warumungas. Dirty Aborigines that lived here for thousands of years. Uh, in 1860, John McDonald Stewart, you know, the name, uh, he's a famous explorer, uh, and it's, it was a, um, his first attempt to go from south to north, it failed, but he got north of Tennant's Creek, and he named uh, the creek after John Tennant. John Tennant was a, a very famous financier that helped pay for Stewart's, um, sport, Stewart's expedition. So he was, he, was, he was like this rich Australian giving him money to go, you know, to explore and map these areas of Australia, you know. And so he named this, this creek in honor of him. That's why it's called Tennant Creek. And uh, what happened in 1872, a telegraph between from Melbourne, Australia to London, this was one of the, the, the little relay stations there, you know, repeater stations they call it, was built there. In 1874, the Tennant Creek Telegraph Station was actually a stone building that they built there, and it still exists today. It's one of the original four intact buildings of Australia. You know, and... Um, yeah, and, and, and what happened was, okay, gold got discovered here. 1927, there's a guy named Charles Winley, a telegraph operator, found some gold. And then what it was, the guy named Frank Jupurla, he was an aborigine, an Australian aborigine. And apparently he found a lot of big gold pieces, and that made it kind of like a gold rush. All the way, the, the population went up to like 600 people, including 60 women and children. Um, yeah, and then uh, there was a famous landmark in 1934, Joe Kilgaroff from Alice Springs. He built the Tennant Creek Hotel. It still exists today. I believe it's a historical monument. Uh, Cecil, in 1935, Cecil Armstrong came, and he in 1937, he built a bakery and cafe. That still exists today. Now, this is a really interesting story about this place. A lady named Mrs. Weber, a very devout Catholic. Okay, she um, she was the wife of a blind owner of a rising sun mine. And now, this was an interesting blind... I, I You know, like, remember I told you about... Um, 
uh, uh, Horatio Nelson, you know, blind one eye, one arm. She was married to a blind guy, and and they actually had a partner or a friend that they liked, where they named one of their minds. Uh, this uh, okay, and this okay, one of the minds that they own was called Nobles Knob, and he and Nobles Knob was a one eye blind guy. Also, he, this guy Nobles, it was named after uh, Jack Noble, and Jack Noble was famous for discovering the Pinnacles, which was these towering limestone things, like like these beautiful beautiful rock limestone towers on Australia's west coast. So, so we're very, so Mrs. Weaver was married to a blind guy that's wealthy. They, they had some gold mines and one of the mines was named after, uh, uh, Noble's not made after Jack Noble, which was their friend, and that Jack Noble had one eye, and and also uh, Horatio Nelson, uh, you know Nelson Fort Nelson, that guy was blind in one eye too. So uh, yeah, a lot of people blind in one eye today in this history. But uh, anyways, yeah. So one of their minds was named after Noble's knob, and Noble's John, Jack Noble was like their friend. But Mrs. Weaver is really cool because she brought a really good Christmas tradition to uh, to Tennant Creek. Every Christmas, she, she was like you know a rich rich mine. Lady, you know, when, when they were wealthy, you know, this was throughout the, uh, the 1930s. Um, every Christmas, she would, uh, 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 they would put up a Christmas tree and they would get gifts to all the kids, uh, you know, uh, to all in, in the neighborhood. You know what I mean? And that tradition still stands today in Tennant Creek, where every Christmas they put up a Chris, they put up a Christmas tree and they give gifts to all the kids. And I believe even the locals and even visitors, they give them gifts. You know what I mean? So they got a strong Christmas tradition here in Tennant Creek. Uh, Mrs. Weber, you know, a devout Catholic lady. And, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, this area during World War II was very important um, for the Australian Air Force. They use it as an uh, emergency landing ground. Uh, gold was discovered here. Uh, later on, bauxite, lead, zinc, silver, copper, magnesium. Uh, that's like their main industries. And they have a huge, in the middle of that, huge cattle graze. There's a lot of cattle go to this place. Um, very interesting place about this. Um, about 65 miles south of Tennant Creek is this cool place called, um, they call it Devil's Marble. The Australian Aborigines call it Carlu Carlu. K A R L U K A R L U. Carlu Carlu or Devil's Marble. And um, it's like these 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 big marbles and these like almost round perfect marbles all over this place. And and year eighteen seventy, John Ross of Australia Overland Telegraph line quote he quoted, "This is the devil's country." He even emptied his bags of marbles around the place. So like these big like perfectly almost perfectly round rocks that look like marbles all over this place. He called it devil's marble. Aborigines call it Carlu Carlu. That's kind of cool. All right, so Tennant Creek. Now we're going to go out to Stoke on Trent in the UK. You know, uh, Stoke on Trent. This is interesting. The motto of the Stoke on Trent is uh, Vis Vita Front Fortier. Vis Vita Front Fortier, which it means United Strength is stronger. Strength United is more powerful. United Force is stronger. So we could all become, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. U UK, Canada, Australia, US. We're going to unite European, American, Australian, Canadian Union, Europe, North America, South America, Australia. Let's all unite, you know. And Stoke means place. It's, it's a Roman uh, a road. Uh, okay, it, it was on a Roman road, you know, uh, uh, um, and in the year 670 AD, uh, it was the first church was built here. Um, um, in the year 1888, there was a proposal to, to create the United Six Towns. In 1910, they did United Six Towns under the town of Stoke on Trent. The towns were Hanley, Burslem, Langton, Stoke, Tunston, and Fenton. So it all became like one big, big happy, you know, it became so it became became a state. Ugh. In the year 1925, it was granted a city status. And this was very interesting. King George V, see, when they applied for a city, you have to have a population of at least 300,000 people to become a city. So the home office of the United Kingdom, you know, they declined to give them city status. Their population was a little bit under 300,000, I think. But uh, King George V, you know, he directly intervened. And on June 4th, 1925, he made a public announcement that allowed this place to become a city. So because of King George V's intervention, it became a city. Uh, the city 
is uh, what has been well known for uh, making a lot of pottery, you know, like pots, like teapots and stuff. You know, the British, they love their tea, you know, British teapots. They made a lot of these teapots, you know, because there's a lot of coal and clay there. Uh, now, a very famous person from this area, pretty was his name was Josiah Wedgwood. Josiah Wedgwood, he was a grandfather of Charles Darwin. You know, Charles Darwin, you know, and Emma Darwin, his wife, he was, he was, a, he was a grandfather. Now, Jos Wedgwood is one, one of the fathers of capitalism you could say he is um he, he was a very successful businessman i believe with these pots uh, man he was a f inventor or one of the first founding inventors of modern marketing like he pioneered direct mail uh money back guarantees you know uh uh, traveling salesmen, uh, you know, pattern boxes for display, dump boxes for display, self-service, free delivery, buy one, get one free, illustrated cat, you know, and, and illustrated catalogs. So things like illustrated catalogs, buy one, get one free, free delivery, you know, uh, money back guarantee, which is very normal nowadays was invented by this guy, you know, um, uh, he was very international. You know, we're going to be one country. Uh, he hired French, German, Italian, and Dutch speakers, Dutch speaking clerks to always answer letters in, 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 the, in the native language, you know. Um, so like, yeah, he, he, very, very multinational corporation, you know, a very successful guy. Um, this area was a big coal mining area uh, for a while until the coal mine decreased. It had a lot of steel. The Michelin Tire Company built the first UK plant. You know, Michelin, they were those French guys. Um, they were really cool people. I saw a story about the Michelin brothers. But they... Um, they built their first their first UK plant here in the 1920s. Um, it's a very international city. A lot of uh, workers, you know, and not just British, but also Polish, German, Irish, Italian, Portuguese, Lithuanian, Romanian, and French, and Spanish work here. You know, cool city. You know what I mean? Um, in 2016, it was ranked the second best city in the world to do business, uh, in, in, in the UK to do business in by, by quality formations. Uh, so this is kind of a cool, you know, it's kind of cool, you know. Um, okay, so UK, Canada, Australia, US, we kind of talked about some cities in these areas. All right, so now we're going to go to... Um, Okay, Switzerland, the, the city of Lucerne, Switzerland, Lucerne. It's got about 82,000 people. Uh, it's in a German part of the country. Um, it's along the Rus River. Okay, after the fall of the Roman Empire, the Alemannic people, the Germanic Alemannic people, started to, started to come into this area. In, seven, in the year 750, in the year 750, the Benedictine Monastery of St. Leo de Gar was founded. In the 9th century, the Murbach Abbey in Alsace bought it, and it became known as Lusania. Luciana, that's how Lucerne came from. And uh, Lucerne could either mean lantern or pike, like pike fishing. Um, that's that's how uh, the name was derived. Um, Luce, in the year 1178, Lucerne became an independent city. In the year 1290, Lucerne uh, joined the Swiss Confederacy with the other three Swiss cities, Uri, Schweiz, and Unterwalden. And then in the year 1386, um, um, you know, and, and later on, you know, Zurich, Zug, and Bern joined this alliance, and they, um, they fought this battle and they gained their freedom. They fought the battle against, you know, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the, the Habsburgs. So they, so they got their freedom. Um, uh, in the year 1419, the first witch trial against a male person was, you know, those witches that were burning their witches. The first witch trial against a male person was in the year 1419. Um, this is really cool. In the year 1333, Chapel Bridge was built here, and that's the oldest covered bridge in Europe. It's called Chapel Bridge. So that's kind of cool. They got the oldest covered bridge in Europe. Uh, from 1520 to 1790, to, from the year 1520 to 7, 1798, there was basically these Catholic Protestant tensions, you know, uh, going all throughout Europe and Lucerne was caught up in it, you know, like, like some Swiss was going Protestant, some Swiss was going Catholic. Lucerne basically stayed Catholic and they had just tensions, just going back and forth between Catholics and Protestants for several hundred years. In the year 1798, the French army, I believe under Napoleon, they invaded Switzerland, um, to conquer this area. Um, uh, 1850 to 1913, well, 1856, they built the first train 
and the railroad, the population massively quadrupled between 1815 and 1913. This is another very international city. They had, um, you know, the workers are German, Italian, Portuguese, Serbian, Kosovo, Spanish, Bosnian, Herzegovinian, Croatian, Northern Macedonian. You know, people from all these areas work here. So yeah, we are going to try to become one country. And you know, Switzerland is a very international country. So like, you know, if we're going to try to make it one country, European, American, Australian, Canadian Union, you know, the Swiss are really active in international politics. And they all know at least like three or four or five languages each. You know, they're pretty, a lot of them do. A lot of them know many languages. So, oh, you know, we need your help in trying to create this union, Europe, North America, South America, and Australia. You know, okay, so that's cool. European, America, Australian, Canadian Union. I sent some cities. Now, Europe, North America, South America, and Australia. Uh, for South America today, I'm going to talk about the city of Porto Velho, Brazil. You know, that's the capital of the Brazilian state of uh, Pandanoa. Uh, apparently, uh, it's in the upper Amazon r River Basin. Um, it's got a population of about 520,000 people in the year 2018. Um, okay, so in, in 1907, it was founded by pioneers during the construction of the Madeira Mamor Railroad. October 2nd, 1914, Port Velo was officially founded, I believe, as a city. Uh, the city's development was linked to this railroad. It just kept going and going over 60 years. A lot of people moving there. They had a very big rubber boom for a while, you know, Brazilian rubber from the Amazon forest, up until Malaysian rubber, which was much cheaper, basically undercut the higher cost Brazilian rubber boom. So the rubber boom stopped. But what happened was during World War II, you know, uh, we lost Malaysia. The Allies lost Malaysia. So Brasilia experienced a very big second rubber boom during World War II until the world ended. I mean, until the, the, the World War ended. Um, um, yeah, um, so it's a really cool place. Um, now, I heard it's a beautiful area. I've seen pictures of it. Really, really beautiful. A really beautiful Catholic, uh, Catholic um, church there. Uh, Catholic Metropolitan Archbishop there. It's a really, really beautiful. Just, you know, they Catholics build these beautiful churches, you know, especially in Brazil. And so, like, I, I seen pictures of it. Be beautiful Amazon forest. Really beautiful city. You know, really cool city. If you guys ever get a chance to tourism and go to Brazil, it's in, it's in the interior of the Amazon. Check it out, you know. Um, um, the main economy of the city was gold. Gold was discovered. And cassiterite. Cassiterite is used for tin. Um, that was discovered. And there are large cattle farms. They they uh, they um, they have a lot of large cattle farms in this area, and uh, so that that was that's some of their main main economies, you know. So that's Portobello, and uh, yeah. So let's all become one country: Europe, North America, South America, and Australia. Now I am in Colorado, so I make it a point to always talk about a city, a local city where I'm at. So right now I'm in Colorado. I'm going to talk about the city of Georgetown, Colorado. You know, I've done these uh, podcasts before in Oregon, so I was talking about cities in Oregon. So we're going to talk about Georgetown, Colorado. I was there a couple days ago, uh, uh, about four or five days ago. It's in the um, it's in the Colorado Rockies. Really beautiful. The Rockies are absolutely beautiful. Beautiful trees everywhere. This town is eight thousand five hundred thirty feet uh, above sea level. Um, it's nicknamed the Silver Queen of Colorado. Uh, the town, you know, was founded in the, the big silver rush of Colorado. The eighteen fifty nine. Uh, Pike Peaks Gold Rush was happening, and what happened was like the, the gold rush brought people here. Uh, five years later, September 14th, 1804, silver was discovered in this area, and a lot of people came here. Uh, the city of Georgetown was named out. Uh, there were two prospectors from Kentucky, George and David Griffith. They settled in Georgetown, and they named it Georgetown after George Griffith. And, uh, yeah, this guy named Jays Huff in the year 1864, he discovered uh, silver at a site about eight miles uh, uh, up the pass in the Argentine Pass. And that's kind of interesting. You know, I'm trying to make us one country, North America, South America, Australia, Europe, you know, Argentina, Brazil, U.S., Canada. So they discovered gold in what was known as the Argentine Pass. And it was called Argentine, Argentina, about eight miles from this place. And... Uh, yeah, so they, so they discovered it. They discovered a lot of. Uh, that's when they discovered silver. Silver made it a very, very big town. Um, the town's bigwigs, you know, the town's millionaires or billionaires or whatever they were, you know, um, they were John Henry Bowman and Lavinia Potts Bowman. A lot of these towns, I got, you know, there's like a, a couple of one or two like really rich people that own like the mines. And in this, or, you know, uh, several, it was John Henry Bowman and Lucinia Pitts Bowman. They helped develop the town, you know, library in there and everything. Uh, they're, uh, uh, there's a city, uh, there, the house they built, the Bowman slash White House, uh, still stands there today. It's like a, it's like a historical monument. Um, 
yeah, so it's really, really cool. Um, uh, thing about this uh, city is that um, yeah, they still have, uh, it's the only Colorado municipality or city that still operates a charter from the territory of Colorado. So their charter is like from the territory of Colorado, not the state of Colorado. That means so they have a police judge as a mayor, not an elected mayor, that would have a police judge as a mayor and a board of selectmen instead of a town council. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so that, that's this town, um, or I don't know, they might be, they might elect this police judge, so the guy's, the guy who's elected, he's a police judge and mayor of the town, I believe, that's what it looks like, police judge is mayor, um, yeah, it, 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 it was, you know, it really boomed during the silver boom, but after the silver, the silver prices collapsed in 1893, it, it lost a lot of people, um, uh, now it's, it's a lot of tourists go there. A lot of it's since the 1950s. A lot of skiers go to Colorado, and this is one of the towns where they stop by before they go on into the uh, the ski slopes. So a lot of tourism. And it's right on the freeway, so a lot of people stop off the freeway. Freeway traffic and tourism s still helps develop this town, I believe. But it's a beautiful town, Georgetown. If you ever go to Colorado, check it out. Check out the Colorado Rockies. Really, really beautiful place. You know, um, yeah. So let's all become one country: the European, American, Australian, Canadian Union, Europe, North America, South America. Australia, UK, Canada, Australia, US, uh, however we want to do it. I even encourage Mexico, Central, South America, the Latin American countries to unite into one country. Let's all just focus on uniting and becoming a superpower. And remember, we're all one big happy family. Europeans, North Americans, South Americans, we go back over 500 years. And with Australians, we go back over 230 years. So we're one big happy family. Let's create the world's biggest country. Remember, everything I got here was most of it was through Wikipedia Creative Commons, which is basically public information. You're allowed to use it for whatever way you want. Um, and, and yeah, these are beautiful countries. Look out for more episodes and, and better videos. We're going to make it one big country, happy country. Have a super happy day.